Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's episode of Poetry Live. Tonight I'm reading from my favourite book, uh, physical book, this one's gorgeous. I'll be doing some Tennyson and Idols of the King. So hello, hello Arcadina, hello Noel, hello, hello Claire, welcome back. Hello Brian and Gams, hello, welcome everyone. It, it is, it's, it's a hefty tome, Claire. Um, I actually bought this in Lincoln, uh, in England, where Tennyson's from, to begin with. Um, yeah, hefty, hefty. Hello, Brian, hello, hello. Hefty. You could knock out a cow if you hit it with that thing. Hello again, Ollie, hello, how are you? Welcome back. He says as he scrolls through looking for idols of the king. We won't do the whole idols, but we will have fun on our way, he says, getting to the start of them. They begin early on. They're a long tail. I'm looking forward to it too. You should be looking forward to it, Claire. This is a wonderful... Here we go. I'm there. Idols of the king. Ah, hello, Susan. Here we go. Lovely. Lovely lines of poetry here. A double whammy of King Arthur tonight, but a very, very different kind of telling. This one heavy with the poetry, um, which is lovely. Lovely. It doesn't get covered nearly as much as it should in the canon of King Arthur, but I am looking forward indeed. Not so much smiting in its traditional sense. But certainly some wonderful epic poetry to share with you all tonight. So, without much further ado, shall we get started, ladies and gents? See how far we can get in to the in fact shall we tell do we tell the coming of yeah, let's let's tell the coming of Arthur. Let's tell the coming of Arthur. Yes, because actually I'm also aware that for lots of people who've been watching the Mort d'Arthur on here, they weren't here for when we were actually back telling the tales of the coming of Arthur to begin with. So here we go. We'll open with a dedication. Hello, hello, Rizella. Come in, come in, come in. You're just in time. Hello, Harley. Welcome. This is the dedication for the Idols of the King. These to his memory, since he held them dear, perchance as finding there unconsciously some image of himself, I dedicate, I dedicate, I consecrate with tears these idols. And indeed he seems to me scarce other than my own ideal knight, who reverenced his conscience as his king, whose glory was redressing human wrong, who spake no slander, no, nor listened to it, who loved one only, and who clave to her, hair over all whose realms to their last isle commingled with the gloom of imminent war. The shadow of his losses drew like eclipse, darkening the world. We have lost him. He is gone. We know him now. All narrow jealousies are silent, and we see him as he moved. How modest, kindly, all accomplished, wise. With what sublime repression of himself, and in what limits, and how tenderly, not swaying to the faction or to that, not making his high place the lawless perch of winged ambitions, nor a vantage ground. For pleasure, but through all this tract of years, wearing the white flower of a blameless life, before a thousand peering littlenesses in that fierce light which beats upon a throne and blackens every bolt. For where is he who dares foreshadow for an only son a lovelier life, a more unstained than his? Or how should England 
dreaming of his sons. Hope more for these than some inheritance of such a life, a heart, a mind as thine. Though noble father of her kings to be, laborious for her people and her poor. Voice in the rich dawn of an ampler day, far-sighted summoner of war and waste to fruitful strifes and rivalries of peace. Sweet nature, gilded by the gracious realm of letters, there to science, there to art, there to thy land and ours, a prince indeed, beyond all titles and a household name, hereafter through all good times, Albert the good, break not, O woman's heart, but endure, break not, for thou art royal, but endure, remembering all the beauty of that star which shone so close beside thee, that ye made one light together but has passed and leaves the crown a lonely splendour. May all love his lover unseen, but felt or a shadow thee, the love of all thy sons encompasses thee, the love of all thy daughters cherish thee, the love of all thy people comfort thee, till God's love set thee at his side again. So ends the dedication to the idols of the king. Tennyson, mourning, lamenting the loss of England's great King Arthur. But he lives on. I love you being here, Lars. So thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad you like my enthusiasm. I hope all is well today over in Denmark. Um, we are doing some Tennyson tonight, Lars. From this book, my works of Tennyson, we're reading some idols of the king. That was the dedication at the start. Fab! Excellent. I'm glad to hear Denmark is doing so well. Now we'll go and tell the coming of Arthur, or at least we'll try and make some headway into the coming of Arthur. It's... For those of you who actually um, watch um, for the Mort to our first show, um, I think it's fascinating to look at the different ways these two stories are told, especially with the language and the verse. Um, I'd be very interested to hear your feedback afterwards, guys, as to how it feels to have it read to you as a poem versus how it feels to have it read to you as prose. We'll have a little experiment tonight. This is the poetry version, the other version is the pro version afterwards. Uh, I'd love to hear your feedback as to which versions you prefer and why. Leodogran, the king of Cameliard, had one fair daughter and no other child. And she was fairest of all flesh on the earth, Guinevere. And in her was his one delight. For many a petty king before Arthur came and ruled in this isle, ever waging war upon each other. They wasted all the land, and still from time to time the heathen host swam overseas and harried what was left. And so there grew great tracts of wilderness, wherein the beast was ever more and more, but man was less and less, until Arthur came. For first Aurelius lived, and fought, and died. And after him King Uther fought, and died, and either failed to make the kingdom one. And after these King Arthur for a space, and through the presence of his table round, drew all their petty princedoms under him, their king and head, and made a realm, and reigned. And thus the land of Cameliard was waste, thick with wet roots, and many a beast therein, and none or few to scare or chase the beast, so that wild dog and wolf and boar and bear came night and day, and rooted in the fields, and wallowed in the gardens of the king, 
and ever and anon the wolf would steal the child and devour. But now and then her own brood lost or dead lent her fierce teeth to human sucklings, and the children housed in her foul den there at their meat would growl and mock their foster mother on four feet till straightened they grew up to wolf-like men. Worse than the wolves. And King Leodogran groaned for the Roman legions here again, and Caesar's eagle. Then his brother King Urian assailed him. Lest the heathen horde, reddening the sun with smoke and the earth with blood, and on the spike that split the mother's heart, spitting the child, broke on him, till, amazed, he knew not where he should turn. For a, but, for he heard of Arthur, newly crowned, though not without an uproar made by those who cried, He is not Uther's son. The king sent to him, saying, Arise and help us thou, for here between the man and the beast we die. And Arthur yet had done no deed of arms, but heard the call, and came, and Guinevere stood by the castle walls to watch him pass. And since he neither wore a helmet or a shield, the golden symbol of his kinglyhood, but rode as a simple knight among his knights, and many of these who were rich in arms saw him not, or mocked not, if she saw one among many, though his face was bare, but Arthur, looking downward as he passed, felt the light of her eyes in his life. Smite on the sudden, yet rode on, pitched his tents beside the forest, and then he drave the heathen after, slew the beast, and felled the forest setting in the sun. He made broad pathways for the hunter and the knight, and so returned. And for a while he lingered there, a doubt that ever smouldered in the hearts of those great lords and barons of his realm. He flashed forth and into war for most of these, colleaguing with a score of petty kings, made head against him, crying, Who is he that he should rule us? Who hath proven him? King Uther's son, for lo, we look at him and find no face, nor bearing limbs or voice like to those of Uther, who we knew. This is the son of Gorloi, not the king. This is the son of Anton, not the king. And Arthur, passing thence to battle, felt travail and throes and agonies of life, and he desired to be joined with Guinevere, thinking as he rode. Her father said that there between the man and beast they die. Shall I not lift her from this land of beasts up to my throne, and side by side with me? What happiness to reign a lonely king, vexed. O oh, ye stars that shudder over me, O oh, earth that sounds hollow under me, vexed with waste dreams? For saving I be joy unto her that is the fairest under heaven, I seem as nothing in the mighty world, and cannot will my will nor work my work holy, nor make myself in my own realm, victor and lord. But where I joined with her, then might we live together as one life, and reigning with one will in everything, have power on this dark land to lighten it, and power on this dead world to make it live. Thereafter, as he speaks, who tells the tale, when Arthur reached the field of battle bright, with pitched pavilions of his foe the world, was all so clear about him that he saw the smallest rock far on the faintest hill, and even in high day the morning star. So when the king had set his banner broad, at once from either side with trumpet blast and shouts and clarion shrilling unto blood, the long land of battle let their horses run. And now the barons and the kings prevailed, and now the king as here and there that war went swaying, 
but the powers who walked the world made lightnings and great thunders over him. And they dazed all eyes till Arthur by main might and the mighty of his hands with every blow and leading all his knighthood through the kings, Caridus, Orion, Cradlemont of Wales, Claudius and Clariance of Northumberland, the king Brandagoras of the Tango, with Anguissant of Erin, Morganor and Lot of Orkney. Then before a voice as dreadful as the shout of one who sees to one who sins and deems himself alone and all the world asleep, they swerved and broke, flying. And Arthur called to stay the brands that hacked among the flyers. Ho! Oh, they yield! And so like a painted battle the war stood silenced, the living quiet as the dead. And in the heart of Arthur, joy was Lord. He laughed upon his warrior whom he loved and honoured most. You do not doubt me, king? So well thine arm hath wrought for me today. Sir and liege, he cried, the fire of God descends upon thee in battlefield. I know you for my king. Whereat the two, for each had warded each other in the fight swore on the field of death a deathless love, and Arthur said, Man's word is God in man, let chance what will, I trust thee to the dead. Then quickly, from the fortent field, he sent Ulfius and Brastius, and the bed of air, his new-made knights, to King Leodogran, saying, If in aught I have served thee well, give me thy daughter. Guinevere to wife. And when he heard Leodogran in his heart debating, How should I that am a king, however much he helped me at my need, give my one daughter to him? And the king's son lifted his voice and called a hoary man, his chamberlain to whom he trusted all things, and of him asked his counsel, What do you know? of Arthur's birth. Then spoke the hoary chamberlain and said, Sir King, there be but two men that I know, and each is twice as old as I, and one is Merlin, wise and ever served King Uther through his magic art, and one is Merlin's master. So they call him Blaise, who taught him magic, but the scholar ran before the master, and so far that Blaise laid magic by, and sat him down, and wrote all things, and whatsoever Merlin did, in one great annal book, where after years we'll learn the secret of our Arthur's birth. Probably a good point to end the poem there. It goes on and on and on with many bits interweaving between La Morte d'Arthur and this too. The same tale but told hundreds of years apart in different ways. Thank you, Lars. Thank you. Did you guys enjoy that? I'm curious. Um, as someone um, who likes to write epic poetry and often gets caught between do you write do you write these sagas in prose do you write them in poetry what, what what works best for you guys listening to having it read which version do you guys prefer me to tell um personally i usually i know i hate it i hate it when homer is written in prose um i much prefer to read homer in verse but what what's a different hair? Well, Helen, I'm glad you like it. Thank you so much for coming. Hello, Gallagher. Hello, thank you, thank you. Herbert, I hope you enjoyed that tale there. And thank you, Lars. Thank you for recommending and sharing this with folk. Um, oh, thank you, Arcadina, for all the lovely, lovely hearts as well. You guys are a wonderful, lovely, lovely audience to have here tonight. 
Thank you, Lars. I'm glad. I'm glad you like to come for the emotions in my voice. I think that for me is is one of the wonderful, wonderful things about being able to do this. Well, Brian, you need, you need to well, you need to go watch the replay of the opening of Sir, of uh, the tale of Sir Tristram tonight. Um, it's very different style, very different going between the two. I'm looking what people like Rosella and Arcadina hiding, hiding there, as I know the two of you have done. Well, that's fascinating. We've got fascinating to get that mix. You're angry, Susan. Why are you angry? What's wrong, Susan? Well, Rosella, that's an excellent, excellent point to make. I imagine it can be very difficult um, to keep up at times. But, but I suppose... Oh, how awful, Susan. Bad internet. Bad internet. I will have to go to the Druidic Stones tonight and uh, see what we can do. Um, about asking the gods of old to make your internet work oh ooh, and hiccup there a little bit better I had to shame Susan we were we been we were reading Tennyson's um, poetic version of the Mort Arthur and I think thank you Rizella if, if by the sounds of it I think it seems that the key thing doesn't so much seem to be whether it's in prose or poetry. We're not, we're in the discussion part now, Susan. We're in, but we're in the discussion part. But what I might do at the end is go and do another quick blast of poetry to send us off before we go to sleep tonight. But it seems if, hello, Sam, hello, come in, come in. Thank you for following me, Sam. Welcome, welcome to the show. It seems that you guys do just like to hear the story, um, regardless of whether it's done in poetry or prose. And so I think bearing that in mind, and bearing in fact that people like Sam have come in um, at the end there, and bearing in mind that it kept cutting out for poor old Susan. Well, fabulous. Well, I'm glad. There, Lars, is something for me to learn. There, perhaps the enjoyment just comes from the telling of the tales, from the reading of um, the poetry. Fascinating. Fascinating. Shall I continue then, uh, since we had some latecomers come into the show, like Susan, and do one last blast of some poetry before we go? Well then, very well, Lars, I shall do it. Susan, I hope this calms you down. We have been telling of the early wars of King Arthur, where he has come to King Leodegras, asked him for um, Guinevere, his daughter, in marriage, but King Leodegran will not give Guinevere unto Arthur unless he knows where Arthur has come from and what his lineage is. He asked his Chamberlain, but his Chamberlain said that the only two men who know are Merlin and his master. To whom the King Leodogran replied, O oh friend, had I been holpen half as well by this King Arthur as by thee today, then beast and man had had their share of me. But summon here before us once more Ulfius and Brastius and Bedivere. Then, when they came before him, the king said, I have seen the cuckoo chased by lesser fowl, and reason in the chase. But wherefore now do these your lords sit of the heat of war, some calling Arthur born of Gorloi, other of Anton? Tell me you yourselves. Do you know this Arthur for King Uther's son? 
And Ulfius and Brastius answered I. Then Bedivere, the first of all his knights, knighted by Arthur his crowning, spoke. For bold in heart and act and word was he, whenever slander breathed against the king. Sir, there be many rumours on this head, for there be those who hate him in their hearts, call him baseborn, and since his ways are sweet and theirs are bestial, hold him less than man. And there be those who deem him more than man, and dream he dropped from heaven. But my belief in all this matter, so ye care to learn. Sir, for you know that in King Uther's time, the prince and the warrior Gorloi, he that held Tintagel Castle by the Cornish Sea, was wedded with a winsome wife, Egern, and daughters had she borne him, one whereof. Lot's wife, the queen of Orkney, Bellicent, hath ever like a loyal sister cleaved to Arthur, but a son she had not born, and Uther cast upon her eyes of love. But she, a stainless wife to Corloy, she loathed the bright dishonour of his love, that Corloy and King Uther went to war. And overthrown was Gorloi and slain, and then Uther in his wrath and heat besieged a gern within Tintagel, where her men, seeing the mighty swarm about their walls, left her and fled, and Uther entered in, and there was none to call to but himself. So compassed by the power of the king, and forced she was wed him in her tears, and with a shameful swiftness afterwards. Not many moons, King Uther died himself, moaning and wailing for an heir to rule after him, lest the realm should go to rack. And that same night, the night of the new year, by reason of the bitterness and grief that vexed his mother, all before his time was Arthur born, and all as soon as born, Delivered at a secret postern gate to Merlin, to be holden far apart under his hour should come, because the lords of that fierce day were as the lords of this wild beasts, and surely would have torn the child piecemeal among them, had they known for each, but sought to rule for his own self and hand, and many hated Uther for the sake of Goloi. Wherefore Merlin took the child and gave him to Sir Anton, an old knight and ancient friend of Uther and his wife, nursed the young prince and reared him with her own and no man knew, and ever since the lords have fought like wild beasts among themselves, so that the realm has gone to rack. But now, this year, when Merlin for his hour had come, brought Arthur forth and set him in the hall, proclaiming, Here is Uther's heir, your king. A hundred voices cried, Away with him, no king of ours, a son of Gorloi he, or else the child of Anton, and no king, or else baseborn. Yet Merlin, through his craft, and while the people clamoured for a king, had Arthur crowned. But after the great lords banded, and so broke out in open war. There, the idols of the king, the coming of Arthur by Tennyson. A different take on the tale of King Arthur. Thank you, Lars. I'm glad you did. We, we're doing it again. We're doing some more of uh, my poem coming up. I agreed to do some more for Dee's birthday, um, which I think is the twenty sixth of October. I think, I think. But we have got we have got some more of my poetry coming up again. I think I think Friday might actually be a good day for it. But I did promise it for a birthday. We'll have to do it for Dee's birthday. But otherwise, Lars, I think you're right. Friday it sounds like an excellent day for it. Um, I am looking forward to doing some more of that. Coming back and doing that tomorrow, though, um, we're doing some Elizabeth Bishop. Um, I'd like to go and share some Elizabeth Bishop with you. So a bit more modern, 
but still a fabulous, fabulous tale to tell. So hopefully you guys will enjoy that. I know I'll enjoy sharing Bishop with you. And then maybe, Lars, maybe if you're very good, if you're very good, Lars, then this Friday um, I might go and do some more of my poetry and we'll go back to the cats of Hashima Island. And, and that could be a lot of fun as well. In fact, I don't think I need much convincing to do that at all, Lars. Um, excellent, Lars. Well, it's a date then. Friday, Friday, we will go and do some more of my poetry. Thursday, we shall go and do some Elizabeth Bishop. Thank you so much for coming and listening. Thank you for sharing it as well and inviting other people. Herbert Gallagher, thank you. Hello, Tara. Thank you for coming as well. And everybody's suddenly disappeared. Oh, there we are. Back. Hello, thank you, Rosella and Susan and Brian and Arcadina. Thank you for coming and listening tonight. I do hope you enjoyed um, a slightly different take on King Arthur. Tomorrow, um, we'll go back and mix it up again a bit more. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you to you. You're a wonderful, wonderful kind of audience. And I love reading to you guys. So as long as you guys keep coming here and enjoying the show... I'll keep coming and reading stuff to you. Um, it's my pleasure. I take surely um, as much, if not more, pleasure being able to read to you guys than you do from listening to me. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for your kind words of encouragement as well, Lars. Um, we'll get back and do some more of my poetry as well. But until Friday and then, well, sorry, until tomorrow, um, I'm going to bed now. Um, I hope the rest of you have a wonderful night, evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Enjoy Denmark, Lars. I hope um, you enjoy the rest of the Danish night. I will sleep. I hope you guys sleep well as well, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone.